I would like to share with you that I visited the uh, VSS lab about uh, a few months ago, and uh, when I met his team, I could feel that it's uh, the energy of a winning team. So uh, I can understand uh, what stands be behind uh, these results, um, which is not with cyber, it's with energy and uh, motivation. Um, so thank you very much, and I would like to invite uh, our uh, second speaker in this, uh, in this uh, session, uh, Professor uh, Dan Bonnet. Uh, Dan Bonnet is a professor of computer science at Stanford University, where he heads uh, the Applied Cryptography Group and co-directs the Computer Security Lab. Dr. Bonnet's research focuses on, appliance, uh, on applications of cryptography to computer security. He uh, received of a 2014 Infosys Award, the 2013 Godel Prize, the uh, Packard Award, and the Alfred Sloan uh, Award, and the RSA Award in Mathematics. So it's our honor to uh, have you here. Please. Uh, thanks, Yaniv. So I was actually under the impression I'm going to be mostly speaking to computer scientists. Uh, so I prepared a, a bit of a technical talk, but I think we can, we can, uh, I can explain it in a way that will be clear for everyone, for everyone. So please wake up, pay attention, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll power, power through this. So the topic I wanted to talk about is what's called uh, the area of uh, uh, control flow integrity, and particularly a way to improve uh, mechanisms for control flow integrity, to, to improve code security and make it harder to exploit code. And this is joint work uh, with uh, two of my students, uh, Ali Masisara, uh, Andrea Bitao, and my colleague, uh, David Maziers. All right, so uh, I guess the first thing I have to do is tell you a little bit about how uh, control hijacking attacks work in practice. So this is primarily targeted at uh, programs that are written in C or C++. Uh, these are very effect effective attacks. They're actually attacks that are used all day long against web servers, against uh, end user uh, software, and so on. So uh, very common forms of attack. The way these things work, essentially, here's just a basic uh, uh, mechanism by which, by which they work. Essentially, you can imagine that you have, um, let's see if I can get the pointer here to work. Essentially, you have a, a certain address that's stored on the heap. And this is, this is an address that tells the computer where to go when this particular function is called. Okay, so when the function is called, control jumps to this particular address. Now, imagine at a later time in the program, all of a sudden, a certain buffer is allocated right next to this address. And then even later on in the program, this buffer, uh, a large amount of data is copied, in, copied into this buffer. So much data is copied in that at, as it's copied in, essentially it overflows the buffer. And as a result, the, um, the value of this address is actually overwritten by something of the attacker's choice. Now you can imagine that when, the, when this function is actually called, instead of jumping to where the program is supposed to jump to, the program jump in, jumps into where the attacker tells it to jump. So these are called control hijacking attacks because the attacker was basically able to hijack the control flow of the program and make the program jump into the attacker's code rather than do what it's supposed to do. And these attacks are amazingly effective in practice. In fact, in our security class, we always uh, give this, these as exercises for students to do. So we give them vulnerable code. They develop these exploits. And to them, it's like a big surprise that they can completely compromise systems using these exploits. Again, just to give you an idea, if a web server is vulnerable to this type of attack, if you direct a simple web request to the web server and exploit this type of vulnerability, what comes back from the web server is not a web page. What comes back is a command prompt that lets you then issue arbitrary commands to the web server. So many, many times when you hear about uh, web servers being defaced, uh, these types of attacks are at play. Now, as I said, these attacks mostly apply to C and C++ programs. These days, um, there's still a lot of legacy code written in C, in C++. A lot of our operating systems, our browsers, are all written in C++ and very often vulnerable uh, to these types of attacks. Today, by the way, when uh, application software is developed, uh, the recommendation is not to use C and C++, but rather use safer languages like Java and Go. Uh, Lisp, unfortunately, is uh, not in the running these days. Okay, so uh, that's basically how, yeah, too bad. So that's basically how control hijacking attacks work. Um, 
there's been a, an enormous amount of uh, work on defending against these types of attacks. So lots and lots and lots of mitigation techniques. This, each one of these corresponds to a research paper. Some of these, many of these have already been deployed and are actually used in practice. So lots and lots of mitigation techniques. This is wonderful for academic research because you can write, keep on writing more papers on uh, defending. Unfortunately, there are also a corresponding set of papers on attacks. Yeah, so uh, lots of, uh, lots of t uh, papers explaining how these mitigation techniques can be bypassed. So there's a bit of a cat and mouse game going uh, in trying to defend and then trying to attack and then try to defend and then trying to attack. In many ways, if you think about it, uh, the incentives for academia, this is wonderful for academia because we get to write more and more papers, um, right? Whereas if systems were perfectly secure, it would be a disaster because we can't write any more papers. So incent the incentives are a little bit uh, perverse, but nevertheless, this is basically where, uh, where we are today. I guess I wanted to mention one attack paper that we, uh, we uh, wrote recently, this, uh, here, uh, this paper on the bottom here called Blind Return Oriented Programming. This is something we, uh, we published last, last year, which basically so shows that the attacks can even work without even knowing what uh, the source code for the attacked application is. So even if I know nothing about your application, all I know is that there's a vulnerability, uh, we can already build an exploit that uh, makes, makes it possible uh, to exploit um, uh, the server. And in fact, the, re the reason this works is we're able to develop a technique by which it's possible for the attacker to essentially gain read-write access to all of memory. Okay, so I want you to remember this because this is going to play an important role in just a minute. The attacker essentially can both read and write to most parts of memory. Okay, and it turns out once you have the ability to read and write arbitrary areas in memory, many of these defenses can actually be uh, circumvented. All right, good. So essentially sort of, sort of a more, uh, you'd like rather than cat and mouse game, you'd like to have more of a rigorous and a robust defense mechanism available to us against these control hijacking attacks. And so there's this beautiful idea called control flow integrity. This was introduced by Abadi et al. back in 2005, where the ultimate goal of control flow integrity is to ensure that as the program, as program execution continues, the program follows exactly the control flow path that's dictated by the code. Okay, so the attacker, even though he might try to mount a control hijacking attack, he can never get the program to deviate from its intended control flow. So is that clear? So control flow integrity, the idea here is that we make it so that programs can always follow the intended control flow path and they can never deviate, the attacker can never get them to deviate from the, control, from the intended control flow path. Okay, so that's the idea. Now how does it work? At a, at a high level, the way this works is as follows. Now again, I apologize, I was thinking I would be talking to computer scientists, so I have a little bit of code in my slides, but I think I can explain uh, what this does. It's not very difficult. So here you have, um, here you have a, a function called a handshake handler that's responsible for setting up a connection. And in this handshake handler, what you do is basically you call one of these function pointers. Remember I showed you the function pointer on the stack that gets activate, activated? Here's the actual instruction that calls uh, the function pointer and will follow, will jump to wh whatever address is written in this particular structure called S. Okay, so the idea behind control flow integrity is that at compile time, as we're compiling the program, what we're going to do, the compiler is going to work hard and he's going to try and figure out what are the p possible addresses that this, uh, in this pointer can actually point to. You can see the arrow here refers to the pointer. So the compiler tries to say, oh, this pointer can ever point to, fi to these five particular addresses. And then it writes that information into the executable that it produces and then at runtime, at runtime, before we actually make the call, what we do is we make sure that this pointer really points to these, one of these five addresses. And if it doesn't, then we crash the program. So is that clear? I'll say it one more time. So at compile time, we figure out exactly what, what are the possible values, what are the legal values for this pointer. So what are these five possible values for the pointer? And then at runtime, when we actually call the function, we make sure it's actually one of these five. And if not, we crash the program. So the idea here is that we convert an exploit, something that will allow, allow the attacker to take control of our server, we convert that into what's called a denial of service attack. So instead of giving the attacker control of our program, all the attacker can do is just crash the program. And that's exactly what we want because typically servers have watchers so that if they crash, they're automatically restarted so that the service is not really affected. 
but the attacker cannot take control of the, of the, of the server, server as a result. Okay, so this is the idea of uh, control flow integrity, and in fact, there are tons and tons and tons of academic papers on this. I only listed a small number here. This is a very active uh, area in the research community, both proposing uh, control flow integrity systems and also trying to attack these control flow integrity systems. So there's a bit of a, uh, uh, you know, push and shove in this area as well. Okay, so in fact, some of, one of, some of these have already been deployed in practice. In fact, maybe I'll just tell you that uh, Microsoft uh, deployed uh, what's called Control Flow Guard, which is a form of control flow integrity into their systems. And here you can see very clearly uh, when Control Flow Guard works, you can see here, this is actually machine code that came out of, uh, out of the compiler. You can see that before the call to ESI, this is the call that actually activates the function, you can see that uh, the, the, the code actually goes ahead and checks that the address that's about to be called is a legitimate address, and if it isn't, the program will crash. Okay, so you can see these things are already very widely deployed and already protecting all of you who are using Windows are already protected by Control Flow Guard exactly in this way. So what does this check actually do? Well, what's actually being checked here is that the address that you're jumping to is actually the valid entry point to one function in your program. Okay? That's all that's being checked. That what's, where you're jumping really is the valid address of a function. So, you know, this is actually all nice and good. This is actually a very uh, wonderful mechanism that was deployed. Unfortunately, this doesn't prevent the attacker from causing the wrong function to get called. So now the attacker is, knows that he can only call valid functions, but he might still be able to call the wrong function that was not supposed to be activated at the time. So although this is a very strong mechanism, it's still not perfect. Is that clear? So it's not perfect because uh, although the attacker is restricted to calling valid functions, he might cause the wrong function to get called at any given time. And in fact, I'll show you an example in a minute where this can completely compromise security. All right, so what do we do? So our starting point was actually trying to look at a very different approach to control flow integrity. And our, our approach was basically to say, uh, well, could we get something that e that's even better than uh, what's provided by control flow guard and uh, would prevent the attack I just mentioned? So the threat model here is the attacker can read and write arbitrary parts of memory, just like in the blind ROP attack. Okay, so the attacker, we have no, we can't assume any parts of memory are secret. The attacker can read whatever he wants. Yeah, this is a very strong assumption. So we, uh, whatever we put in memory, the attacker can, can, can get a hold of. And typically by giving the attacker as much power as he wants, we're basically being very conservative. So our goal is to build syst uh, systems that are secure even though the attacker has all this power. And, our, and then our goal is to make sure the program doesn't deviate from its uh, control flow uh, graph. Okay, so how do we do all this? Well, the way we do it is actually by using, uh, well, something called a cryptographic checksum. So here I'm, apologize again, this is a little bit technical, but I think I can explain again how it works. Um, so what we'll do is basically every time we write one of the addresses to memory, so remember I showed you this address that was written to the heap, every time we write an address to memory, what we actually do is also compare, compute some sort of a cryptographic checksum on that address. It happens to be a 64-bit cryptographic checksum, and we store it right underneath the address. Okay, so now every time an address is written to memory, right underneath it, we store a checksum. Okay, and now to compute this checksum, you have to know a certain key, yeah? so there's a certain secret key here, this value K, that presumably only the program knows and the attacker doesn't know, and so only the program can compute these checksums, and only it can check that these checksums are valid. Okay, so again, every time an address is written to memory, we compute a checksum and store the checksum next to the address. And then every time we want to activate an address, so every time we want to jump to a particular function, we verify that the checksum is valid, if it's valid, we jump. If it's invalid, we crash the program. So again, we follow this approach where we convert an exploit into a denial of service attack, which is the best we can hope for, and that's what we uh, are able to do. Okay, so uh, one thing that should come up in, mind, in your minds right away is I told you that there's a secret key here that the program uses to compute the checksum, and the obvious question is where do you keep the secret key? If you write the secret key to memory, there's a problem, right? Because the attacker can read your secret key and then he can produce checksums that would allow him to create invalid addresses. So the solution is actually to keep the uh, addresses in registers. And so there are these things called XMM registers, which I guess I won't 
uh, won't talk to, won't talk about it at all, but essentially the key always, always, always lives in registers and none of the attacks that we've di uh, discovered so far are actually able to extract information from registers. Okay, so this key essentially is safe throughout the life of the program and so the program can generate and verify these checksums but the attacker cannot. So let me give you an example of uh, where this is useful. And so again, I apologize, I was thinking that I would be speaking to uh, folks who, um, well, who know, who would understand this. Could we do like a quick, quick show of hands? How many folks know C? How many folks can read this? Ah, oh, okay, a good, a fair, a fair amount, excellent. Terrific, fantastic. Nevertheless, I'll, let me walk you through what this code does. Okay, so what, what we have here is basically we have a handshake handler. So this is a function that handles, you know, a, a, a handshake to set up a session. What it does is when it receives the handshake packet, it goes up and says and sets up a handler. The handler, uh, say, is the login handler. Okay, so the ampersand here means this is the address of the login handler. Okay, so this creates a function pointer. This creates a pointer to the function called login handler. Here's login handler. What login handler does is it goes ahead and checks the credential of the persons connecting to you. And then it goes ahead, oh, this is my old, okay, it doesn't matter. And then it goes ahead and calls the data handler. Okay, the data handler, what it does is actually it goes ahead and processes the actual data. Is that clear? Very simple code. So again, we, we define the lo login handler, the login handler checks credentials, calls the data handler, and the data handler actually does the operation. Now, here's the point. Let's imagine that this handshake handler ha has a buffer overflow uh, inside, has an overflow in, in, inside of its code. What this means is basically the attacker can cause this S handler value to be whatever he wants it to be. Okay, so there's no, uh, nothing preventing the attacker from setting this to whatever he wants. Now, think back to the way I explained that control flow guard words, remember, works. Remember, conf control flow guard says, Every time you jump, you can jump to any entry point of a valid function. So what does the attacker want the function to be here? Well, he wants to bypass the check credentials check. So what he would do, what would you do? I guess I, I should follow the previous speaker and quiz the audience. What would the attacker do? What would he want the S handler value to be? Fantastic, actually, he's exactly right. So what he would do is he would set the S handler value to point directly to data handler, thereby bypassing the credential check. Now data handler is a perfectly valid entry point to a function, so this is a way that you can bypass control flow guard and, compl and control flow guard will allow this to happen and uh, credential checks would be bypassed, bypassed altogether. Okay, so the thing is with our method, with our, um, with the cryptographic guarantees that we provide, the, prob the reason this, the attacker can't do this is he cannot create a valid address. Remember, for this login handler, he has to create a valid checksum, but the attacker can't create a valid checksum. And as a result, he won't be able to do anything like this. He won't be able, if he tries to overflow the value of S handler, then uh, the program will crash and will never bypass the credential check. Okay, so that's the idea at a very high level and ha that's how this works. So the only thing I want to tell you about, maybe I'll take one, one minute to do that. Uh, I'll tell you that, uh, what is the performance of this? So here I'm talking about computing uh, cryptographic checksums here. There's an AES here. Uh, these are kind of considered to be relatively expensive operations and I'm describing doing that on every single function, function call. Turns out, uh, we, did, we actually went ahead and implemented this inside of LLVM. LLVM is a C, C++ compiler, so we now have a compiler that supports all these operations. There's extra optimizations that we implemented beyond the basic approach. And then we experimented with web servers, with caching engines, with uh, databases. And you can see that the performance is actually relatively reasonable. It's usually about a 3% slowdown, although in some cases the, the slowdown was, was slightly more than 3%. Now, to someone, to assistance person saying, you're doing AES all the time and all you have is a 3% slowdown, that seems impossible. I must be cheating you somehow. What's going on here? How are we able to do this with only a 3% uh, performance cost? And the reason, the reason we're able to do it is actually because of Intel. So Intel did something incredible to their uh, recent processes, uh, processors. They added something called the AES NI instructions. So AES NI stands for AES New Instructions, which is a sequence of instructions that lets you evaluate AES in hardware remarkably fast. This was so successful for Intel that actually their competitors were uh, uh, required to add that in. 
And beyond their competitors adding them in, they've actually improved the performance of AES and I over the last couple of cycles. So you can see the degradation in the, the, the improvement in running time uh, as the processors evolve. And in fact, the next version, Kirby Lake, will even have further improvements. So the reason we're able to get um, our performance to be as good as it is, is actually thanks to Intel because they have sped up uh, the AES instruction as well as they did. And now this is actually a viable method that we can actually use in the real world. Okay, so my point is uh, fast encryption, AES I should say is an encryption engine. Fast encryption all of a sudden has these unexpected applications like protecting control flow integrity. This was not anticipated by uh, the people who designed AES, they, the AES and I. They built AES and I so that web traffic could be encrypted more efficiently, but now it can actually also be used to pr protect um, software control flow. And so if, if we had faster AES and I, which we hope to have in the next version of the processor, you know, the 3% might even be replaced by 1% which makes this a viable uh, thing that we can deploy. Okay, so that's what I wanted to tell you about. I guess I'll stop here and I'll, I had the link on my other uh, slides, but there's a lot of, uh, everything is open source. There's a lot of information available on this on the web. Um, and so uh, I will stop here and take any questions if there are any. Thank you. Oh, what? A layman's question. I love those, yes. Well, see, the problem is the data handler doesn't know who, doesn't quite know who's supposed to call it. Ah. That's actually one of the defense techniques. Yes, that is indeed, that's a very good question. That's actually one of the defense techniques. Uh, it turns out we can bypass those, some of the attacks that I mentioned will bypass those simple, those simple methods. So, yeah, a very good question. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot.